Welcome to another instalment of Bunkai Strategies. On this occasion, we're going to show a technique, we're going to have a look at a principle, and I've got a question to feed right back to you. Okay, so for our technique of the week this week, we've got this wonderful thing that we call Manji Gamai, or Manji Uke, some people will say. First thing is the translation. The manji is um, like a reverse of the swastika. So some people would like to call this a snowflake block or all sorts of other weird names. Um, essentially, they talk about it as being a high block and a low block at the same time. And you see some stuff with guys where there's one guy punching from over there and they're blocking up there and someone else is attacking from down there and you've got to block that as well. And we both know that the, uh, the realistic outcome of that situation is that the next thing is, while well, you're blocking that and punching that, he's just going to smash your face in and there's, the other guy's going to be all over you. So instead we have to consider how we'd use that um, and uh, make sure that it's something that we can use against the kind of attack that people really do. So our technique, Manji Gamai, and this one's been suggested by Claire Potter Sensei. And um, what she specifically asked me for was to not grab the neck. Because she's very well aware that what I like to do is to use the technique to come in here and pull like this. And we say that that's an absolutely fine application for the Manji Gamai. But when people see that, they often say, well, the technique goes out to here. And we say, yes, that's the idea of follow through. We're going to try and take the hands out that far. You won't ever make it. When you're punching, you're going to punch to here. And then the rest is follow through. It doesn't always make it if you make the contact part way through the movement. If you're making contact at the end of the movement, then we're never going to get there. Um, we're never going to cause the damage we need to cause for self-defence or for the martial art to be effective. So then, we've got to have a look at how else we'd like to use this, because that's what Claire's asked for. So what we'll do this time is, we'll have that big right hook, and we're going to receive that here, and then we're going to slide in here and get the strike this way, using the whole of the forearm across the kidneys, and this is then going to cause the back of the elbow to be braced against the back of the neck here. And you can see that that's, uh, that's quite unhelpful for us. <laughs> um, we just show that from the other side so that you can see what goes on. As that comes in, we've received it, and at the same time we're going to duck. And as we're diving into here, I need to stop him from stepping across me. So this leg is shooting in to prevent movement, creating a base while well, I get my head in behind here and make a strike, while this gets to pull back here. So that then looks a lot more like the full technique that, that Claire Sensei was asking for. And then we, we never ever leave things at ones, do we? So instead, let's have a look at it again. And this time as the punch comes in, we're gonna bring it over us like this. And we're going to turn the palm upwards and come down this way. And this time we'll make our strike to the front of the body. So we get that strike down. Is it going to be the groin? Maybe. Is it going to be across to the hip and take his balance? Maybe. And this is again pulling on this to extend and make his other hand go away. Because that's the one I don't want to get hit with. If I've managed to control this one, then the next thing to fear is that one over there. So we get this kind of posture again. Okay. So there you go, you've got a couple of applications for Manji Gamai and they're um, variations on a theme and it was specifically avoiding the, uh, the one that we might actually prefer to use which is to come in here, take this and get stuck in like this. Oops, accidentally fed you a third one. So in the previous episode, we dealt with a principle that we called redundancy, the idea that there's a further part that's not necessary but can enhance the technique, or a part that you aim for, and if you go to that point, then you get the best result, but if you don't go to that point, then you still get a good result. And on this occasion, our principle is going to go a little bit further than that as we talk about the idea of follow-through. So redundancy was about how um, if I'm aiming to hit on exactly this spot here, then I'm going to have a really good effect. But if I just manage to catch the jaw, then it's still going to be good. 
Whereas the idea of follow through is that I'm trying to hit that spot there, but I'm not trying to hit it at the end of the technique. Instead, it's the idea that I'm going to go through the target and, and penetrate the target. And the same thing applies to all our techniques. It's easy to see when we're talking about hitting that we could make the contact here and continue through. And the problem comes when we talk about things like joint locks. If I lock here, then we say, well, that's locked. And that looks like a technique all on its own. But what we're not seeing is that there's a follow-through portion to this movement. The follow-through is to get this hand back to here the way you practice your form. The follow-through is to get this hand all the way across the body the way you for practice your form. And what the problem with looking at follow-through is that to do that you've actually got to hurt the person you're working with. So we're going to show very, very gently that this comes around here like this. And therefore you can see some of it. And then we show the shock part of it much, much shorter without the follow through. And you get the effect there. And you say that if we had the follow through and the shock of the delivery all in one, then there would be harm to the opponent. The question to you is, with the principle being follow through, how does follow through affect the idea that there are two parts to a movement? Let's give you an example, let's say a kick. If the kick involves a knee raise and a foot out, how do you ever reach the foot out position if the knee raise has got the follow through? 